everybody, and welcome to the first episode of Drunk in the Library, where we get drunk and talk to you about the strange, the unusual, and the downright stupid things you didn't think you need to know about. I'm your host, Kayla Flickinger, and my co-host, Brooke Lessel. Everybody, welcome to the show. Brooke, what's our hot topic for the day? We are going to talk about body farms, which I made the mistake of looking up videos <laughs> to. So, obviously I already told you I wanted to do this topic, which was, I thought it was going to be different than what it was for whatever reason. Like, I kind of know the gist of a body farm. But... You thought you'd be plucking them out of trees. Ah, uh, yes. Harvesting <laughs> them. No. Um, <laughs> I guess I've never researched, well, I haven't researched a body farm, because what? why would I do that? But, um, I wanted to make sure that I had all my information correct, and I watched a video on oh, it, God. and that was a big mistake. <laughs> And I honestly thought about abandoning it after watching that video because I'm like, this is fucking gross. Oh my god. Um, but I told everyone that's what I was doing, so I was going to stick yeah, with it. Yeah, do it. So, I got all my information from Wikipedia, obviously, because that's where I get most information from. Um, HowStuffWorks.com and all that's, all that's interesting.com and I fucking love science. Um, <clears throat> so basically, what do you know about body farms? Nothing. A literally, absolutely Seriously? nothing. Seriously? Not a thing. Oh. Not a single thing. <clears throat> well, then I'm sorry. I'm about to tell you some really awful shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, basically they're not tech- they've used farm as like a technical term, but, um, they are basically- they put out bodies and try to see how they decompose and they use that for science purposes and hmm. for, um, like law enforcement just to see, I guess- for when they find a body, they can study, like, how long has it been dead for? Did the elements affect how this was decaying? So there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, the first uh, body farm was discovered, well, not discovered, but was created by anthropologist uh, William M. Bass in 1971. Um, and that was at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, he basically just kind of wanted to study the effects of not only the environment but like just how corpses decay in general okay um the story as to why he finally did this was actually really funny um the police kept coming to him and were like you gotta help us solve this case because he knew a lot of stuff about that and in, in general anyway um but one such occasion they um basically found this civil war grave of uh, this colonel named William Shy, and they noticed that it had been disturbed. Okay. So they thought, okay, somebody either robbed it and put another body in there, um, or something else funky was going on. So um, Bass ended up looking at the body that was in this grave um, and noticed that it was, like, pretty fresh. Okay. So now they're thinking somebody killed somebody else and put them in here to make it look like, you know, they were buried here sure. the entire time. Clearly not thinking that, like, why would, why would there be a fresh body in a Civil War grave? Right. So, um, they did some research and found out that it was actually the dude that was buried in the grave. Because he had been so well preserved in whatever crisps Substance. or things. Yeah, he had been, like, embalmed, um. And what and year was this? This was, I think, in 1971, if okay. not around that oh, wow. time. Um, but they, you know, were surprised at that. So that whole thing launched. Now he wanted to do this study of other corpses and to see, like, okay, if it's kept in a coffin for such and such amount of time, what's it going to look like after this many years? Mm -hmm. um, so then he came up with the idea of the body farm. Um, so obviously, like, it's used in forensic anthropology, um, in crime scene investigations, but there's a lot of other people that use them as well. Um, in the United States, there is seven of them, um, ranging from subtropical environments, um, like Florida, to northern Michigan. Okay, I was gonna ask if they had them in, like, multiple environments. They do. Um, not everyone. Like, I think the closest one to us is South Carolina. Okay. Um, but even I then, mean, I'm like... Not I'm not, like, sad that there isn't one closer. No, but, like, we have a different environment than, like, the Carolinas do. So, like, yeah. they don't have one, like, in the Northeast that, mm -hmm. like, they're able to I mean, to you probably at. just, like, split the difference for us between Michigan and South Carolina. 
I guess so. You know, yeah, like, I all mean, right, this, this body's in Michigan. It's doing great after three months. South Carolina, not so much. Jersey, somewhere in the middle. Yeah, well, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would make sense, but I don't know if they're looking to make more of them. I kind of hope not, because seven's no, a thanks. pretty good amount. Um, they do have them in other countries as well, but they're not, they don't operate the same way that we do. Um, so the largest one is in Texas, and that's at Texas State University at the Freeman Ranch, um, and that's 26 acres. And then they also have facilities, um, they have the first one at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, Western Carolina University, uh, Sam Houston State University, so I don't understand why there needs to be two in Texas, but I digress. Texas is very big. They have the same environment <laughs> everywhere. It's not like, I don't know, man. It's not like it's like snowing <laughs> over here and like desert over here. Like, I mean, come on. You don't need Texas, two. Texas, man. <laughs> Whatever. Southern Illinois University and uh, the Colorado Mesa University, and then, as I said, University of South Florida. Um, and they all kind of have, they, they do broadly the same thing, but they also have different, different purposes, which I'll get to later. Um, but one of the things that I came up with while I was researching this, and I've looked this up before because I'm sick and I needed to know, um, but basically what happens after you die and why they're studied, like the different things that they study. So like when I was initially went into this, I was like, well, do they just like throw them yeah. out like, into like a field and like right. hope for the best? Like, <clears throat> excuse me, are they wearing clothes? Are they not wearing clothes? Like there's a lot that's involved in it. How do you get your body there? So each facility is different. Um, Basically, they started off by getting unclaimed bodies from, like, a medical examiner's office. Okay. Um, and then later on, they went on to get them, like, I guess they still get them from there, but they went on to get them from people who donated them. Um, so, you can actually donate your own body if no. you decide to. <laughs> <laughs> to science, um, yes. To body farms, no. Well, body farms are science, so I think after you're dead, I don't think you get to pick, like, a subcategory, like, all right, you can have my body science, but don't put me on a body farm, that's all I ask. Um, So, people could donate their body, and they have to sign a form to ensure that, like, their wishes are obviously carried out. Um, So then, if they don't decide to, but also didn't leave, like, a will or anything, like, wishes what to do with their body, their family can do it. Yeah. So make sure you specify <laughs> that you don't want to go to a body farm. Please do not put me in a body farm. You can consider this my official will. And husband. <laughs> this is valid in New Jersey. <laughs> but only New Jersey. So you only better New hope Jersey. you don't die out of state. Correct, yeah. Um, so they don't take um, unknown or unclaimed bodies. Because those are the perfect ones. Yeah, it is. <laughs> You're just letting it quite literally rot away when you could be using it for science but to rot away um, for science it's considered unethical sure. um which i guess i get because later on if someone's like oh, oh shit where's uncle charlie yeah oh, he went to the body farm yeah i mean i guess i'd be pretty pissed yeah so i understand that um they also won't take people who are like really really sick so, if you have, like, HIV, um, hepatitis, or, like, any kind of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, they won't take you. Okay. Um, they're very, like, specific about that. Um, I think if you have, like, pneumonia when you die, I'm sure that that yeah, might like be that. fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> even, like, certain like, types honestly, of Honestly, the HIV hepatitis thing is probably more about accidentally passing it on, passing it on to a worker. Then yeah, but even the then, state of decomposition. when I when I was going through this, there was like a whole thing in here too about how like w- once you're dead, like all the bacteria that's causing that kind of stuff dies with you. Oh. So like, or not bacteria, but like any kind of diseases like that, they the cells break down. So you hmm. you don't get to you don't carry that stuff off to other people. Like it I guess dies. that makes sense. So I don't know kind of what their goal is in that. Then. Right. Um. But, I mean, those are the rules, so... Sure, them's the rules. Who are we to... to yeah, I mean, I'm not a body farm scientist, so I don't fucking (laughs) know or make the rules. And even if I did, I don't know if I would take (laughs) bodies like that anyway. I don't even want bodies. So... (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I'm not collecting over here. (laughs) No, the only bodies that I'm okay with are, like, bodies of water. Like, leave everything else. And I don't want to make a farm of that, so... That'd um, be really hard. 
No, you just make a bunch of lakes. That's not fun. So I'm talking you're harvesting water. Good luck. Let's go. <laughs> what do you mean good luck? You put it in a bucket and you call it a day. Where you do you think... have different ideas of what it takes to harvest something then? What is harvesting? But you gotta like work it out of the ground, man. You're cultivating. You if you put water in a bucket, you're not cultivating the water. If you dig a hole and then water springs up, then you're harvesting water. Okay, well then maybe that's what I would do with my <laughs> body water farm. <laughs> you're not invited when I open that up because <laughs> you judge me. I won't go. thank you in my state. <laughs> okay, fine. I'm not gonna follow. Fuck that place. What if that's your ticket to a landlocked state? You what? harvest water when you get there. Does that count? I don't want to go to a landlocked state. I <laughs> don't care if you're telling me, oh, you're going to have your own farm. I don't fucking want to go. Okay. I won't. Unless you're telling me that Taylor Swift is inviting me to her house in, like, Tennessee, which I'm pretty sure is landlocked. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay. Thank you for confirming. <laughs> I'm not going. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to have to miss out. Those states don't have anything anyway. I have no desire. Um, all right, so then every facility also is different as to what their procedure is in taking these bodies in. Most of them are obviously placed in a freezer. Um, they do have ones that are pretty similar to what the morgue has. You're not using your run-of-the-mill fucking Kenmore and no. throwing a goddamn body in there. Um they get a number to identify them, and then they're placed, like, in specific spots on the farm. Um, they do map them out so that they know where each person is. Um, what I did find in here, too, was that some of them are clothed while some of them are naked, just hmm. because they're going to decay a little bit differently. Um, some of them also, they place them in different scenarios, so they might throw them in the trunk of a car. They might submerge them underwater. Some of them do have cages on top of them because um, in Texas in particular, I think I read, um, vultures are really bad. Mm. So they need to keep that away. But yeah, other ones, scavengers. Yeah, but other ones they keep out in the open because they want to see what's going to happen with right. the scavengers. So there's a variety of situations that they'll, uh, they'll put them in. Um, sometimes they're in shade, sometimes they're in the open sun. Um, they did note that sometimes they'll put them in high grass. Like, everything is a factor in that. And that's why I think that they have so many different forms too because they want to see like certain weather like michigan is obviously pretty cold cold and snowy so that mm -hmm. body's going to decay a lot slower than right. something that's out in florida or texas um so when they first started this too some of them didn't actually use bodies of people they used pigs hmm. australia i think in particular i'm gonna have to double check but i think i read that it was australia um still uses pigs um, so, that was pretty interesting. I guess, which I guess, like, do pigs decay the same way that humans do? Um, I mean, probably fairly similar. They have, like, a similar skin composition, because, like, I know that's what, um, like, tattoo artists, when they're apprenticing, practice a lot of times on, like, pig skin, mm. because it's made of, it's, like, a similar composition to like ours. a couple of years ago, I don't know if you watched it, there was a video that they put, like, I'm pretty sure it was a pig, that they kept underwater, like, a dead pig, it was underwater in a cage, and they wanted to see how that decayed, mm -hmm. like, while submerged, and, like, all the little fish came in. I think there was, like, a time-lapse video of that. That was actually pretty interesting. Um... And much easier to watch than a tour of a body farm. So, um, there was another uh, factor, which was the soil acidity. Mm -hmm. um, that can change how fast they decay, but that can also show you how long a body's been there. Um, because the grass changes color. Right. So, the grass yeah. around it will turn completely black. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, so I thought that was uh, actually pretty interesting. Um... Because when you die, like, all, your your blood your basically goes, leak. well, yeah, but your blood goes to, like, the lowest place in your body. Mm -hmm. So, um, obviously, like, if you're laying on your back, it's everything around cool you is going to cool. Yeah. So, um, I also <laughs> went through, just in case people don't know, they're going to know now, the process of death and what actually happens to you when you die. Um, which it takes a lot longer than I thought that it did. Um, so obviously your heart stops beating, and then you don't get any oxygen anymore, so everything else is going to start to die off. So your brain cells die, um, 
usually within seven minutes, your brain cells are completely dead. Hmm. Wow. That's um, fast. Yeah. Uh, your bone and skin cells survive for several days, though. That makes sense. Um, and then, as I said, your blood begins to drain from other places and goes to, like, the lowest parts of your body. Um, three hours after you're dead, rigor mortis sets in, um, which stiffens all your muscles. And then after 12 hours, that's when you're cold. Um, within 24 hours, you basically are, you have no heat in you at all whatsoever. Um, and that's called alger mortis. And then, um, after 36 hours... Alger or outer? Alger. Alger, okay. Yeah. Um, and then at 36 hours, um, your muscle tissue is no longer stiff at all, so it's just kind of hanging there. Right. Um, 72 hours, then rigor mortis goes away. So then you're just kind of, like... Floppy. Floppy. Yeah. Um, so then, as I said, like, all... You're bacteria or diseases or whatever you had inside of you are going to die with you right. and that stuff does start breaking down as like your cells die um your pancreas has enzymes in it that will cause it to basically digest itself so then um at that point you start to smell um which is really gross and i've said it before and i'll say it again there is no smell that's like that so i can't imagine these people or students, I guess they are, and scientists that are on these farms that have to go and check on these things every day and, like, have to get a good whiff of what that smells like. Yeah. I think I... that we should just briefly clarify why we know what that smell, it, smell is. You don't know you... what that smell is like. Well, you don't need to go that, into that specific detail, but just for a little bit of history, we're both veterinary technicians, so we're both, like, very familiar with, like, the death process. Yeah. For, and I yeah. do know what that smells like. <laughs> But not a human body. No, no. A human body is no. much different than an animal body. An animal body is pretty fucking gross, but a human body you will never forget. No. Ever. That's, it's like ten times when it, like, the worst animal you've ever seen is. Um, and even that, I feel like, doesn't even describe it. Um, but, yeah, at that point all your fluids leak out, and then the flies come. And they lay all their eggs, and um, they can lay up to 300 eggs in a day. And from that you get maggots who will basically eat anything and everything. Um, within a day they're basically eating the entire body and they'll finish that off relatively quickly. Um, within seven days up to 60% of the body is already gone from maggots. And um, at that point, I don't want to say like, de decomposition obviously doesn't stop. It keeps going, but it slows down a lot more right. than um, people think that it does. So, like, your body won't lose all of its tissue or flesh um, until about 40 or 50 years after you die. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's I thought lot. it was pretty quickly, but I yeah. guess, like, it also depends on where you this, are. Right. Like, yeah, if you're out, yeah, if you're out in, like, somebody's fucking backyard, right. you're probably going to decay more out in the open. Um, but it also depends on, like, how deep, like, if you're in a coffin buried, like, 40 to 50 years is probably, like, average as to tissue. Also, I know that they have, like, those sealed coffins. So, um, I don't think bugs can get in that. Mm -mm. So that might even take longer. Probably, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, that was part of that. And then if you're in water, you're going to decompose, decompose uh, twice as fast as if you're on land. Um, decomposition is the slowest underground, which was kind of assumed, um, which I wish that I had, like, put in here, but do you know about peat bogs? Yes. Peat bogs, peat bogs are, are like, very cool. Peat bogs are very cool. We mm -hmm. should do an episode on that. Um, but that's, that's interesting because that's in water, but it's not. Yeah. So... I wonder how long they take to actually, like, break down in peat bogs. Peat bogs are actually phenomenal preservers. I know, but, yeah. like, eventually if you're in there long enough, like, aren't you going to decompose? You don't. They found, they found... At all? Not, it's, it's a, like, obviously you do, but it's a very, very slow process. Like, some of the best preserved bodies we found from, like, previous, um, like, not even centuries. Like, you're talking back, like... Neanderthal days oh. are have been found in peat bogs. That's freaking cool. Um, yeah, peat bogs are like real weird and awesome. 
Um, so yeah, that's decomposing. Um, and then as I said, there's at least seven facilities um, of body farms in the United States. Each of them kind of do something different. So the first one, as I said, was the University of Tennessee. Um, and then they're the ones that place them in like the trunk of a car or put them underwater. Um, and they help with a lot of like forensic cases. Okay. Um, they were kind of like a leader in doing that. I feel like they should all help with forensic cases. They do. Like, what else are they doing? Yeah, I mean, you're not. <laughs> what else do you need Why that information are we doing for? This? Um, they all kind of do, but like I think the University of Tennessee, like that's their big okay. thing that they're gotcha. doing because they were started to help with forensic right, cases. Right. Right. Um, or that facility in general for the body farm was started for that. Um, so then, oh, they get a hundred bodies, um, at least every year that are donated to them. And then as I said, you can, so many. that, yeah, they have a lot. Um, well, I think they're like 2.5 acres of land. Wow. Um, and people can pre-register to be on the body farm. Um, so... They said that 60% of their donations are made by family members or individuals who are not pre-registered. Wow. Yeah, that's how they get most of their bodies. Um, but over 1,300 people did pre-register wow. to be donated, which I don't understand Specifically that. to that one or like you I can, think to that if one. you just register, you go to any of them. I think it's that one. Okay. Um, I think you can probably register for some of the other ones unless they have specific ways that they obtain their bodies. But I think that one in particular, they have, like, a pre-register kind of system going. Hmm. Um, but if they're taking, like, 100 a year, at least, because they only have the space for that, like, what are they doing with those other bodies? Because if you're putting it in a freezer, you're going to change the way that that, like, decomposes, I would think. I... I would imagine only for that period of time. And they're probably able to factor that into their studies because no matter what a body's going to go in a freezer before it goes to a death farm mm, to a body farm not necessarily in here there's a i i it's here somewhere i did read it um that they don't come in like that um western carolina was the second one to open up and um they actually are used for cadaver dog training okay so that's their kind of like claim to fame there um then there's texas state university they have like a separate ranch called uh, freeman ranch and um they they were the ones that were having the problems with like the vultures um they get a new body every five to six months okay. um and they usually come from hospitals funeral homes or medical examiners offices um these ones are basically strapped to a gurney loaded into cargo vans and then just brought there hmm um and they start right away. I don't think they get frozen. Yeah, but even if it came from, like, an ME's office, an ME... Well, yeah, like, they it, are. It comes but, like, out of a freezer I don't think they have, like, a specific, like, law that's, like, you can't freeze the body. Like, I right. think in that case, yeah, but, like, if they just, like, died at the hospital, mm. they might just bring them straight from there. Maybe. Um, depending. Like, if someone was there with them, saw them, like, if one of their loved ones was there and was like, okay, like, this is this is what they wanted, mm -hmm. and then just did it, they might not Maybe. Have, yeah. Because obviously they're not having, like, a funeral then. Right. Uh, but the funeral home one, yeah, they would have to, probably, they would have to freeze them. Um, so. And then, to date, they've received 150 bodies. They have 200 more, at least, planned. Um, and then they have around seven acres of land. Um, the Freeman Ranch has much, much more at 4,200 acres, um, but they also do other, like, the ranch does ranch work, too. <laughs> like, oh, my. Yeah. That's surprising. They're not just, like, You're like, hey, I'm gonna go ride a horse, and maybe you also look at the bodies. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm sure, obviously, they're probably in separate areas, but, um, yeah, that I thought was interesting, because they're just, like, multi-purpose. That's like terrifying. Multi-purpose ranch. Yeah. Um, then there's Sam Houston State University. Um, they accept human body donations for purposes of scientific research. Um, they're 247 acres um, near the National Forest at Sam Houston. Um, they have a huge area of uh, maximum security fencing around their facility, obviously. Um, most of these places actually have, like, razor fencing. 
um, so you can't just jump on in there. And then um, they use webcams to um, monitor their bodies and kind of see how they're changing. Okay. Which I think is cool because you can do like a time lapse on those. Yeah, then. yeah. Um, and I was thinking that before too when you were talking about the coffins, like it'd be neat if you could stick a webcam in a coffin to monitor how bodies decompose yeah. in those coffins. Like a, a glass coffin or something yeah. like that. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm sure that they, they, they probably, probably do. Yeah, they probably have. We'll, we'll take a look and see if they have anything like that. Um, cause that would be really cool. Cause they, I mean, like they can do that with other things. So why wouldn't they do it with that? Um, and then they have like a morgue and a cooler with freezer units. Um, and they do a lot of like their stuff on campus too. Um, cause they have like radiographs, like they'll take like x-rays of these bodies. Right. Which I think is really cool. Um, and then they're cool too, because like, I think of all the places they have, um, the highest temperature. Okay. Um, so theirs is about 75 degrees, like average temperature around that area. Um, so they can kind of see how things decompose differently than all the other places. Um, then there's Southern Illinois who they started with pigs, um, and then slowly transitioned over to humans. They have the lowest average temperature, um, but they also have the highest average wind speed and the second lowest elevation, most acidic soil, and worse soil drainage. Hmm. So they have a lot of interesting factors yeah. affecting their bodies. Um, I'm interested to see how, like, wind affects it. Yeah. Because I guess, like... That probably speeds it up. Maybe. But maybe not, because if it's blowing away all the flies and everything mm, from being on True. Ice, so I'm just thinking that it's blowing across it, and therefore, like, more... I guess microorganisms are being exposed to it. Maybe. Um, but they got their first human donation in 2012. Um, they also use cameras to um, look at their bodies, but they also use it for security purposes. Um, this is where the word clandestine came in, because mm. they like to mimic clandestine body disposal situations. So basically uh. ones where people try to hide them, so they'll bury them under leaves, they'll, like... They'll put them in put situations them in where they're yes, where they're not immediately like, noticeable. Seen. Yeah, because um, they want to see how like that decomposition process works. Um, there's Colorado Mesa University. They have the highest altitude and the driest environment. Okay. Um, probably slows it decomp down. Probably. Quite a bit. Um, I wonder how altitude affects it though. Uh, well, the only thing that I can think of is that, like, higher pressure means more stress on a body. Mm-hmm. However, h- higher altitudes usually means cooler temps, which would decrease decom time or increase it, I guess. Yeah, but Colorado's, like, they have cooler temps at night, but during yeah, the day, they're like... right. So I guess it depends on how high that altitude is. Like, if they're above the snow line, then it's probably pretty cold year-round there. Yeah. Hmm. Um, they got their first human donation in 2013, and then as of 2018, they had 11, um, bodies on their property. Um, so they are kind of, like, on the lower end of it. There are no Tennessee. I like that idea. I feel like 100 is a lot to keep track of. Yeah, like, I feel like 11 is, that's modest, you know, like, (laughs) we do modest work here. (laughs) (laughs) We can really give them the attention that they deserve. Exactly, like, this is Harry, he's my favorite, he's hidden under this pile of leaves, so you can't really see him very well, (laughs) Um, but he's a good guy. This is Jane, she's in the trunk of this car, we haven't opened it yet. Right. Yeah. (laughs) But there's a webcam to make sure she's doing okay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh man could you imagine you come into like school and you're just like oh let me check the dead body cams make sure that they're rotting appropriately and yet, that's literally somebody's job <sighs> how do you yeah yeah I guess you, you make the interns do the grudge work yeah i guess so um so then the last one is the university of south florida which they have a 3.4 acre um research facility um, and they utilize the, hum- the UFC uh, U- Human Donation Program. So they, I guess, have people donate to them. Um, and they're open to scholars and researchers. So people who aren't actually working on the facility can come in 
check things out. Um, That's pretty cool. Yeah. I, well, I think they all should be like that. Yeah, Because, absolutely. like, you're doing what's it for the research. Point? Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you share that with the people who right. need it? Right, Um, Especially, like, if someone from, like, Colorado wants to come and check out what Florida's university is doing. I was thinking that, like, they must have, like, really solid communication between them, so that way, like, whoever's working on the forensics one can call them up and be like, yo, I got this guy down, I'm sure in, they do. down in Florida, you know, what's decomp looking like at 11 months, you know, or something yeah. like that, you know? Yeah. Um, but they opened, they're the most recent one to open, which was in uh, 2018. They had five bodies to start, um, and it is the only facility... Um, in Florida, but also in, like, a subtropical environment. Okay. Which makes me wonder what the one in Australia is considered, because wouldn't that, I would think that that would be, I guess, subtropical, but maybe not. Mm, I don't know. I guess it depends on where it is. Australia is so big, it has multiple climates, you know? Oh. You got, like, the desert, you've got, like, a more tropical area. Yeah. Um, I think parts of it are fairly temperate. Hmm. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that is Body Farms, but I did put a little bonus in here, because- cool. I read this article a while ago that I had to save because I thought it was amazing, and it was about how cats love uh, to eat the bodies on Hell body yeah. farms. Um, so this was ob observed at the Carolina body farm. Um, the first cat that they found actually found the body of a 79-year-old woman and started eating at the soft tissue and the fat. Um, then they had to place it in a cage because the cat kept coming for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, they didn't do it because of the cat. They actually had to do another research project on it. But the cat couldn't access it. So, in the meantime, the, um, you know, he stopped coming to the farm. But then they took the cage off of it, and that same cat came back to that woman. Every night. Aww. Over the course she of 35 her. days. He yeah. loved her. Yeah, I'm sure that's what her. it was. Um... Once again, went for soft tissue. Um, he ex ended up eating so much he exposed a bone in her upper arm. Why didn't they shoot it away? I guess because they want to <laughs> see, like... What happened? Yeah, but then there was another cat that... But wait, did that cat get sick? No way. I don't think so. There was a case, though. Um, maybe, I don't know if it was this next one, but I did read one in that same article that a guy had died at home, and he had, like, ten cats, who immediately oh, hell went yeah. for him. Hell yeah. But he had died of a drug overdose. Mm. So then all the cats ended up dying because oh, no. they weren't eating the drugs. The drugs. Oh, so poor cats. They can pick that up. Mm. They don't expel that when they die. So, um, And then the second cat found a 70-year-old man um, and came to him for about 10 nights um, and then left the body alone for a month and then came back for another two nights to eat him again but the he same like, body man that meal i had a couple of weeks ago was so good i'm gonna go see if he's still around they he like ignored all the other bodies they put huh. new bodies out he didn't go to the new body he wanted the other he one. wanted the 70 year old man huh which i thought was really weird um so yeah they uh well they put ones out that were in like similar states of decomposition to see okay. if that's what it was that was drawing them to yeah them. nope just wanted it the was same that dude, dude. yeah that's interesting um so, they did say that they were definitely feral cats. They were not domesticated cats. Right. I don't know if that really has anything to do with it. I mean, probably not because you told um, the story about the drug addict. Yeah, I mean... I, cats are opportunistic. Like, if, if you die in a house with cats, they, they're going to they're they're, they're eat you. But honestly, dogs would do the same thing. Cats are going to do it quicker, though. Yes, like, yeah. they're not going to waste no, any time. No. Like, they know that you're, you're the food source. You know I'm a very happy cat owner. I know. Barry and Ben would eat me in a heartbeat. Oh, 100%. It's fine. They, I'd, they I'd, I'd be happy to be a meal for them. <laughs> <laughs> One day. <laughs> One day you can live out your dreams. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, they uh, they thought it was really weird because, like, they normally don't scavenge. They are preferred hunters, but they kept coming back to these bodies. Um, and they preferred the spots where they previously ate from so those soft tissue spots that upper arm that they tore away mm. to the bone um and that they both of the bodies were in similar states of decomposition so that is like a weird link where they prefer to eat them when they're in a certain state hmm. it was just weird that they went back to the same bodies um so yeah that was basically it for body farms cool cool Glad I finished that, because that was a lot and made me very grossed out. 
What do you have? Okay, let's pause that. I need a refill. Okay, I'm gonna cut this out. All right, okay, what you got? All right, so I'm going to talk about one of our least favorite things in the world. Great. Running. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so have you ever heard of a little thing called the Barkley Marathons? No. Okay, so they take place in... It involves running. Why the fuck have I ever heard of it? <laughs> they take place in late March, early April of every year. So they yeah. would be going on around this time. This year it got canceled. Thanks, Corona. Um, so in the United States? Yeah, they take place in Frozen Head State Park down in Tennessee. Okay. Um, so basically this is a 60-hour, 100-mile marathon shrouded in mystery and intrigue. <laughs> No, 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so 40 runners do this every year, but hundreds apply. Okay. Um, so in order to apply, you have to write an essay on why you think you should be allowed to run in this marathon. Another thing I hate. And the entrance <laughs> fee is exactly $1.60. Okay. It is completely arbitrary. $1.60 means absolutely nothing. Okay, just a fucking random, like, yeah. dollar sixty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just to clarify my sources for this were obviously wikipedia mm -hmm. and i watched there's a uh, documentary on this on amazon mm -hmm. called the barkley marathons the race that eats its young oh god so um it has been going on when the documentary came out i think it was 2015 it had mm -hmm. been 25 years so it's been about 30 years that this has been happening now mm -hmm. um the co-founders are you're going to love this oh god their names are raw dog and Lazarus Lake. Legally? No, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Can you imagine your fucking name being Raw Dog? You go to get your but driver's like, license renewed, is... and they're like, uh, sir, sir, are you Raw Mr. Dog? dog? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's me, Raw Dog. Um, Lazarus Lake is kind of like the head honcho of this. He's definitely the one that like I saw more in the documentary. Does he look how he is named? Yeah. Okay, because I have a very specific image in my mind, and I just want to know if... Yeah, most likely. Okay. No He's one like, with a normal name... No, no. Or no. with a name like that is looking like they're normal. Um, so, as of, as, as of right now, mm -hmm. um, 2019, the, this race has been, been completed only 18 times in history by 15 different people. Okay. One of them is a three-time winner. Alrighty then. Okay. So, let me break it down for you. <laughs> you're Jeez. going to you're going to arrive at this Tennessee State Park okay. on um like sometime on Friday. There's a ton of preparation work. If you have run this before, you are obligated to bring Lazarus a pack of cigarettes. That is your buy-in. If you have not run this before, then you are a uh, Barkley Marathon's virgin and you bring him they change it. Um, sometimes it's a flannel shirt. Sometimes it's a white t-shirt. Sometimes it's socks. Um, you bring him whatever his described buy-in is and a uh, license plate from your home state. Any license plate. How? You, you, In man, the fuck. If you want to do this, you'll find a way. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of weird illegal elements of this. It's all very weird. It gets weirder. It, it just seems like like redneck run um so actually most of the people who run this are graduate like have graduate degrees because it's very much a like this is this is a test of endurance man <laughs> you're gonna go an entire weekend you're not gonna sleep you're gonna get at most three hours of sleep at, over the course of this weekend and you are going to run 100 miles um there is 120,000 feet of elevation across this oh this run, God. which is the equivalent of running Everest twice, of going up Everest twice. You and I can't even climb a mountain. I know. By <laughs> I know. There is no way. <laughs> I would okay. rather be on a body farm. I know. <laughs> Put me on the So, um, you get there on Friday. Like I said, there's a lot of prep work. Everybody gets a number. Mm -hmm. Um... Lake is going to put out a, like, a master map. This is the only map you're going to see with the loop marked on it the whole weekend. Is this the same, this is the same place they hold it every year, though? Yes, yes. So, is, does the map change, or is it... Um, it 
does the more you if you're if you're a veteran having run this you'll come in with more information but you're still gonna get confused because you're okay. not running on a trail you're running through the woods oh okay. this is not a trail Alrighty then so you are um you get this is your only opportunity to look at at lake's official map of this year's trail essentially okay um you are not permitted gps you can't, like, take a picture of his map or anything like that. So he only shows it to you briefly, and then it's just, like... Yeah, it'll be out Friday later. night. It'll be out Friday night. Whoever wants to can look at it. Every There's, like, a huge sense of camaraderie around this. You're going to be there with 40 other people who are, like, just as intense about this as you are. So there's going to be plenty of discussion on how you're going to get from A to B. Um, and then sometime between midnight and, uh, I think it was, like, noon of the next day... You're gonna hear somebody blow a conch shell. <laughs> it you don't know when. You don't know when. That is your signal that you have one hour till race time. Uh, it could be any it could be 1201, it could be 10 a.m. <laughs> it could be anywhere in between. You don't know. A fucking conch shell. Yeah, so you're gonna hear somebody blow a conch shell. That means it's go like you got one hour till race. Oh god. Everybody's gonna get their last minute shit together. They meet at this yellow gate in the woods, basically. So basically. This is a, it's a loop, so you're gonna start at the gate and end at the gate, and it goes up into the woods, back down around for, um, the first loop. Then the second loop, it's the same thing, but you're gonna do it in reverse. The third loop, clockwise again. The the fourth loop, counterclockwise. And then the fifth loop, um, whoever is gonna go out on the fifth loop, the first person that's leaving is gonna choose which direction they wanna go, and then you're gonna alternate. So if the first guy says, I'm gonna run clockwise, the next person's gonna run counterclockwise. Now, do, they're doing this over a course of a couple days. Yeah. Okay. But so, you, like, so do you take a break between each loop, or no? Y- you can. A lot of people just take brief breaks to, like, get geared up, and okay. then go back out. Um, because you, and you can also count yourself out at any point in time if you (laughs) succeed on three loops it's called a fun run if you succeed on all five it's the full barkley and like i said there's only been 18 finishers (laughs) so um basically uh what was i gonna say about that um so lake is gonna light a cigarette and that's when the race begins what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he was inspired by this when a prisoner escaped from uh, a a prison down there, like in the middle of the woods. There's okay. this penitentiary. A dude escaped from it back in like the 60s or 70s, mm-hmm. and um, he got like eight and a half miles over the course of like three days before they found him. And Lake made a joke like, "I bet you I could have done a hundred miles in that time." Um, yeah, and that's, smokers on, <laughs> <laughs> that's basically how this, this was born. Um, FYI, he has never completed it. Yeah, because he's a little bitch, probably. <laughs> um, nobody probably. really has an idea of when it's gonna start. You get 60 hours, and like I said, there's like a fuckload of elevation in this. You're basically climbing the equivalent of Everest over the cor- cor- course of like 60 hours in this run. Okay. Um... Every year, one one person is deemed a virgin, and they are chosen as a sacrifice, basically. And um, that person always gets number one when you're when you're handing out the numbers. That person is always going to be number one, and that person is deemed the le- least likely to finish one lap. Okay. Um, anytime that anybody taps out, uh, taps is played on trumpet for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just embarrassing. <laughs> uh. So, basically, how do you how do you know that people are even completing this loop? Like, how do you know I didn't just go two hours out into the woods, two hours back, and called it a fucking loop, right? But even then, like, if you know the area, couldn't you just, like, go up part of the loop, cut through? Well, <laughs> there are loose checkpoints along it. So, basically, you're gonna oh. get to a checkpoint, and there's a book at the checkpoint. If my number is number 13, I have to tear out the 13th page of the book. To okay. print back as a checkpoint monitor, basically. Um, I think the year that the documentary was taken, there were like 11 checkpoints. So you, everybody had to come back with 11 pages. Otherwise, it was forfeit. Okay. Um, Damn, they thought of everything. They did, yeah. 
so the only time that runners are permitted to sleep or like any first aid or anything like that is interloop. So like if you finish a loop, you can stop and do, you know, take care of any first aid and like, man, these people, their legs, you're literally running downhill at one point through just like briars. They called it, I think that area of the race was called rat jaw because it's, it's literally just like trees filled with briars. Exactly. Their legs were coming back streaming blood. Who wants to do this? I don't know, man. Everything about this is my worst nightmare. I know. So, uh, like I said, you listen for the conch sometime between midnight and, and 12, and that's how you know the race is about to start. Sometimes that conch will blow at midnight. If it happens at midnight, the race is starting at 1 a.m., so you're starting this race in the dark. That's terrifying. Yeah, and if that happens, then loop 1 and 3 are both going to be run at night. 2 and 4 are both going to be during the day. Wow. Yeah. Literally horrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, the, the runners are going to alternate directions on that final loop, Okay. Um, nobody has died doing this. I feel like that's important to admit because you I'm and I, shocked. you and I would die. We would die in the first loop. Oh, we wouldn't make Halfway it. through the first, not It would halfway. take 60 hours to do one loop. For sure. <laughs> With how long it takes us to do anything. Yeah. I like, I really just think about that time that we climbed Mount Tanamini and Man, that was a mistake. Going uphill, I, I think going downhill was honestly worse. Because at that point, we were fucking exhausted. Going downhill was so much worse because it took three times as long. Because you had to make sure you didn't slip. Yeah. So, I can't even imagine what going, like, around this loop and then having to come down hill. Not only just, the, like, a mountainous hill, but, like, briar patches. Yeah. I would just lay down and die. Yeah. Just, mm -hmm. just run me over. Let me die. Um... One of the checkpoints, so like I said, this this race was inspired because a dude got out, like, escaped from this prison. Mm -hmm. um, one of the checkpoints is right outside of the prison, and I'm talking, like, the book is taped, like, to the wall of the yard, basically. Like, and when you get to that one, you have to um, crawl through, like, it, not crawl, you can walk through them, but there's tunnels that go under the prison, and that's where you're going next. I feel like that doesn't like seem that's legal. I know. Like, but I feel like being on the property of a prison, they're like, what are you doing? You're not, I guess you're not technically, on, like, you're on the outside of the prison. But I can't imagine that, like, these people are happy, like, the guards are happy that these people are out there. It's like that episode of Riverdale, where they're in, like, the, the <laughs> yard playing yeah. football or whatever they're playing, and the girls are cheerleading on the outside. That's basically this, yeah. And then had to crawl through the tunnels to get her, to get Archie. Sorry if I spoiled that for anybody. <laughs> it was like two seasons ago. I know. They probably should have fucking caught up on it for now, but whatever. <laughs> Just in case. Um, are you curious at all about where the name the Barkley Marathons comes from? Well, well I'm assuming <laughs> that uh, it probably came from either the prisoner's last name or the people who created it, because I know that they were not born Raw Dog and Lazarus something or other. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, enlighten me. It is a completely um, mundane I should have name. Known that. Bark uh, Barry Barkley is one of late Lazarus Lake's friends, and he just decided to name the uh, the race after him, which I think is really nice. Unfortunately, R.I.P. Barry Barkley did pass away this past December, um, oh. and like I said, this year's race was actually canceled. So. That kind of sucks. I think like, that, like, the whole concept of this is super interesting. Like, it's it's <laughs> just shrouded in so much mystery it's and intrigue. interesting, but it's honestly terrifying. Like, oh, yeah. I, like, I can imagine. I I kind of get the appeal of it. It's probably for, like, thrill seekers. Like, yes. people who are, like, really into doing, like, those, like, weird one-off things. It absolutely is. And people who are very <laughs> into, like, seeing how far you can push your body. Yeah. I am. I'm not. Unless, like, you can, <laughs> unless you're asking me how long I can sit on the couch for consecutively. Yeah. Not yeah, I'm not pushing myself very far. But I far think that the concept the of it is super interesting. One yeah. of the guys in the, um, documentary, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, he was a winner of the year that, uh, that this took place. Do you get anything if you win? No, just the satisfaction of knowing that oh. you completed the Barkley 100. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty elite squad. There's 15 of them. Yeah, I guess. In the world. <laughs> How many um, years but have they been doing was, this for again? Huh? How many years have they been doing this for? 
Uh, I th about 30. Okay. Um, but this guy was a, like, he studies climate change. Okay. So he, and he's, like, he's working on, like, a pretty high up degree. I think it was, like, his PhD or his mm. doctorate in this. And, um, he, like I said, he studies climate change and how that affects the world. And the, um, license plate that he brought was from Antarctica. Which I think is really cool. That is really cool, yeah. actually. Cause, and mean, he was from PA. Oh. Well, good for him. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you obtain a license plate from Antarctica, because I'm pretty I, sure... I think, that like, that he must have worked there at some point. But he was But even cool. then, you don't have fucking cars there. Yeah. Nah. You are in one little research area, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. And even if you did have cars, did they need a license plate at that point? Like, I know Buck drives the blue Chevy, like... <laughs> <laughs> If he, if I, he runs into my penguin, I'm gonna know it was him. They're not playing that game where they're, like, on the fucking ice road, and they're like, look, Hawaii! Right, like, like <laughs> well, there's another Antarctica, I guess. There's like, two cars on that, on that continent, and you know both of them. It's probably, like, the first license plate, too, that just it displays a continent. In it. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I mean, I, maybe Australia does, too. Yeah. Australia yeah. doesn't Although have... they might do it by province, because we do it by state. True. Because they've but, got provinces. Yeah. All, well... Or Antarctica does not, though. No. no. <laughs> You're in one spot. Yeah. All six people of Where are you driving to, them. also? You're not going yeah. to the grocery store. <laughs> You're not going to visit your friend Sam up the street. Like... I don't know, man. But, yeah. Um, I do think it was important to note that there were very few ladies who do this competition. That's fair. Um, most likely because we have a brain. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Um... Also, well, because where our time is better spent doing something else. Yeah, there are, if you're curious about, like, how do these people ensure that they're not getting dehydrated, there are two water drops at, like, the highest points on this run. Mm -hmm. um, however, sometimes it's really cold, so the water's frozen. That would suck. <laughs> so they're not allowed to bring, like, water bottles? No, with them? definitely bring water bottles. You're allowed one oh, you backpack. Are. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, like,. You're probably going to pack that with water bottles, Gatorade, and, like, band protein bars. Yeah, and Band-Aids. Banana chips. Honestly, Band-Aids, just wait till <laughs> you get back. <laughs> you just do what I did. Just, like, one water bottle, banana chips, a couple Band-Aids, and some bug spray. You're set. I don't think bug spray is going to gonna help you in this one. Uh, yeah, I mean, didn't really help me much last time that happened, so... Yeah. Neither did any of the other supplies I brought. Um, I think that is pretty much it. Do you have any questions regarding this? Nope, I think I pretty much asked them while you were doing that and you successfully answered them for me, so. Okay. I just can't believe that people do that. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. I I truly commend anybody who is willing to put their bodies through that and their mind through that. Can you imagine the mental stamina it takes to be awake for upwards of 60 hours at a time? I, no, I can't even stay awake for, like, 24 hours. I know. You're lucky if I can get through 12 hours the, uh, without napping. The guy from Antarctica, he, like I said, he did finish it. He clocked in with 18 minutes to spare, so he was, like, really coming in by the skin of his teeth. Um, and he, he crossed the finish line and was literally, like, I've been hallucinating. Like, oh my god. he was straight up hallucinating from lack of sleep and dehydration. God, that's awful. But, I mean, whatever. To each his own, I guess, if that's what you want to do. Man. Good for you, but... Yeah, I could not do that. I, you won't find me doing any running. <laughs> at all. Unless something's chasing me. I know. And even then, I might just lay down and let it happen. <laughs> I really have no desire to move any faster than I normally do. <laughs> Maybe a brisk walk, but that's... That's probably all you're going to get yeah. out of me. So, I am not a runner. Ever. No. Gross. Well, that was, uh, that was good, actually. I have not heard of that. I was really surprised, because I was, I was racking my brain for what you might do, but you told me I, I didn't, know. I haven't heard of it. I, I have know. not. Um, so. shout out to my friend Tori for the idea for that episode. She's the one who introduced me to this. Cool. Cool, cool. All right. Well, that was our first episode. Woo! We made it. We did we it. We did it. So. We will be back next week then with more fun shit. Cool. Until then, I don't know, get drunk. Yeah, learn some shit. <laughs>